There's no reason you should be defeated. God will fight your battles with his might. So walk away from darkness. Leave behind defeat. In Jesus there is happiness complete. Absolutely glorious day in the neighborhood. <laughs> what a wonderful day that the Lord's given us to worship Him in and to learn how to walk in His Word and His will. I'm Dr. Stephanie, your host, along with my co-host, Pastor Karen Weitzman, and together we welcome you to Living the Word. Did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God, so get that expectation level elevated. When you do, you'll come expecting to receive and gain wisdom, insight, and understanding, and you'll make a better revelatory connection with your heart and your mind. So, open your hearts and prepare to receive. Pastor Karen and I will be bringing you understanding of the practic and practical application of God's Word to your life. We're going to discuss the commandments that Jesus gave us in our blood covenant, His statutes and ordinances, and how to operate in them in our daily life. We not only will be imparting God's wisdom, we will also be giving you insights into our God and His character to help you grow in Christ. So stay with us and learn how to apply and walk successfully in living the Word. Good morning, Pastor Karen. Good morning, Pastor Stephanie. How are you? Oh, delightful. Just delightful. It's a beautiful day. Rested beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Here we are doing Mr. Rogers again. <laughs> it is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> it is. Yes, here also. Yes, life is good and God is good and he's always good, isn't he? Yes, he is. Now, right it's now, just... folks, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread or a cracker and a swallow of some sort of beverage and juice or juice, and set it aside, because later on in the program we're going to pray over it, sanctifying it as the body and the blood of Christ. Also, I want to let you know we do have a chat room that you can enter during the program to ask questions and make comments, and we'll, we'll address them later on in the program. We have a section of time that we've set aside for that, but if nobody does it, we just bypass it. <laughs> so anyway, send us your comments. We're open to, to discussion, and if you have questions, we're happy to answer them right here and now. But let's begin by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us. Pastor Karen, will you open us in prayer? Yes, let's everybody, let's everybody bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we praise, worship, and adore you today as we seek your face and your will in our broadcast, Living with the Word. Father, Scripture tells us to forgive and to turn the other cheek, to pray for those who come against us, to bless those who curse us, and not to repay evil for evil. Grant us the grace, Father, to forgive from our hearts and allow your mercy to flow through us. Search us, O oh God, to know our hearts and allow your grace and mercy to prevail with all people that are listening to us today. Give us your wisdom to love our enemies and keep peace with all our brothers. We know that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks, so we speak forth your will for our lives. And we know that your will is to lead us in the way, the truth, and the life everlasting through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, today we're going to be continuing our discussion on grace. And this week, we're going to begin delving into God's love for us. As we move in that direction, Pastor Karen has a bit more on the subject of forgiveness that needs to be imparted. So I'm going to turn everything over to her, and then we'll move on uh, later on in the program. Pastor Karen? Hi. Uh, yeah, I thought we ought to revisit forgiving others in order to be forgiven by God. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we go to uh, Scripture, Matthew 6, verses 14 through 15. Here Jesus makes you know a very strong statement. He says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And right away, that, that verse probably throws everybody into a state of worry. Uh, but I think we have to remember that Jesus' words, when they're spoken, they're spoken for a particular reason, at a particular time, under a particular covenant, to a particular group of people. So we have to think, who was Jesus talking to at this when he made this statement? Well, first of all, they were spoken before he went to the cross, before he was resurrected, so we know we're in the Old Covenant. He was speaking to the Jews, 
who were under the Old Covenant. And we know that in the Old Covenant principles, they're opposed to the New Covenant pr principles. So the Old Covenant prin principles tell us that if you do this, God's going to bless you. And if you do that, he's, if you don't do that, he's going to punish you. So we know that the Old and the New Covenant are opposed to each other. So if we uh, look at the post-cross, um, the resurrected life of Christ, uh, we have a new covenant. We have a new covenant reality, and so when we look at Matthew six fourteen fifteen now, we see that we're uh, encouraged and exhorted to forgive others, but we're not commanded to forgive others with the threat of not being forgiven if we don't. Mm -hmm. So um, here's where grace comes in. Here's where we change our focus. Our redemption now is not based on what we do, but it's based on the finished work of Jesus. It's finished, Jesus said. So Ephesians 4, uh, 32 says for us, Now we can be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. So what I, I think what I'm saying is now we have this post-cross, resurrected life of Christ where we're now in Christ. We have a new identity. Um, we're uh, righteous and we're, we're totally righteous. We're totally forgiven in the Lord. We're new creations joined as one spirit with the Lord, partaking in the very nature of God. So it doesn't give us more of a license to sin, but it gives us a license to live according to our righteous identity. Amen. So I, th I thought we ought to bring that out in that we are now running to people to ask for forgiveness because we have this righteous identity in Christ. It's not a thing, it's not a, uh, we're not at a place where we have to worry. Our focus has changed. And in ch changing our focus, that uh, brings out this new reality uh, in us, in Christ. Amen. That's a good word. I agree with you 100%. Um, and in that way, too, our forgiveness then is free-flowing. We're supposed to let it flow to others. It's it's uh, We've been forgiven much, and so everyone else who thinks they haven't <laughs> don't have a whole lot to be forgiven of are mistaken. We're all forgiven much. And um, consequently, we should be forgiving others. And and when we live in that, we're, we're actually then viewing the other person through the blood of Jesus, which is my my favorite expression <laughs> anyway because that's the way God sees us is through the blood of Jesus and we should be seeing from God's perspective as well so I, yeah, I agree and, with and you we're going to be talking about love today mm -hmm. and of course that love is imparted to us through the Holy Spirit so the more that we're walking in love and the more that we uh, appreciate God's mercy mm -hmm. uh, we're going to flow as you said it's, it's going to flow out of us amen and that's what we're designed to do we are created to be in the image. We are in the image and the likeness of God. That means that we are in his uh, creative abilities, in his characteristics, in the, the actual imprint, blueprint of God is, is stamped on us. And it's mm -hmm. in us and on us. And then, of course, Jesus being the exact duplicate, the exact blueprint of God himself, because he is the second person of the Godhead, is now our complete imprint. It's it's blended into us, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and with Holy Communion we are complete with his blood. So, hallelujah. That makes me excited. Yeah. I'm ready to dance already. <laughs> 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 By the time we get to this program, folks, I, I have been bro uh, doing broadcasts and classes <laughs> as Pastor Karen has. All day. And, and I am already uh, floating. <laughs> <laughs> in the anointing, so it's it's uh, a great time to be here. <laughs> That's why I said it's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> so th by the end of this broadcast, we hope we all hope that we're going to be floating with you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, um, I agree with you. And and uh, you have anything further you want to bring up on that? No, I thought that that, that was just a point that we needed to uh, look at again. You're right. And maybe a new perspective on people if we didn't bring that out when we were talking about unforgiveness yeah, that we have I'm, to be cognizant of who jesus is talking to and whether it's old covenant new covenant and how you know help it helps us apply it apply to our everyday lives and how we should walk in christ amen that's, that's such a good and timely word and i'm glad you brought it up again because we should remind ourselves of that all the time 
you know, because it brings us right back into perspective the way we're supposed to be and in the will of God, because uh, we don't, it makes you very much aware of the fact when you're not being forgiven or forgiving, I should say, instead of unforgiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, we were talking and as Pastor Karen said, we are going to be talking about God's love today, God's unique love. And a relationship with God is like no other relationship you may have experienced. I'm not talking about knowing who God is or going to church and genuflecting, crossing yourself and, you know, going through the motions of, of a service or the religiosity portion. I'm talking about knowing God, having a relationship with Him that, that you will find is so unique. When you get to know God, you're going to find out it is a unique experience. God has a unique kind of love for you. And it's unconditional. Now, we talk about agape love, and, and everybody talks about agape love, and we go, what's that? You know, because we think we know, but we don't know. Because even though we uh, have experienced God's unconditional love, we haven't, it hasn't made a heart and head connection with us to the point that we think of it as still conditional. We still want to bring the law back in and, and put the conditions back on it. When, in fact... Unconditional love, God's unconditional love, is so great and so unique and so marvelous that the experience of it, when you finally get a hold of what it means that God loves you and you see what that is in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit, it is, it is person changing. It's not just life changing. It's a personage changing. It's, it makes you completely... Not only are you already a new creation in Christ Jesus because you have become one when you move into him from the born again experience, but now that born again experience is starting to mold and shape you and take takes you into a different person than you thought you were. And you'll find that you're being molded into the creation that God wants you to be, the part of the body of Christ that you're supposed to function in. You know, <clears throat> yeah, and I think, this is why we slip. Here's one of the main reasons that we slip back into the law, mm -hmm. because we do not understand agape love. You know, yeah. maybe our parents said, you know, if you do this for me, I'm going to love you. And if you don't do this for me, I'm not going to love you. And the relationships, marriage relationships, uh, you take a look at that. Maybe you get angry at your spouse and you decide not to talk to him mm -hmm. for a while. And what, what do you what do you end up doing? You end up trying to control the other person. Exactly. So, you know, we, this is one of the main reasons I think that we slip back into the law uh, is that we don't understand the agape type of love. And hopefully uh, this broadcast that we have today and maybe next week will, will help, help people understand a little bit more. Amen. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's like uh, there's an interesting point that I want to bring up, but I'm not going to say it right now because I think it'll fit in better later. <laughs> But it has to do with that marriage part that you're talking about and a slipping mm -hmm. out of out of uh, agape into conditional love. But mm -hmm. it can happen with anything. It's just that the, when you mention marriage, it makes me it made me run right over there into that little box and, and want to talk about sure. it. But unconditional sure. means that it's not based upon meeting certain c criteria or certain conditions. God loves you because he loves you. Simple as that. Now, in this love of God was made manifest among us, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. So he doesn't love you based upon your performance. It has nothing to do with you and what you're doing. There's nothing you could possibly do to cause God to love you any more than he already does. And there's absolutely nothing that will cause God to love you any less. He loves you even more than you love yourself. Because most people that I know say, well, I hate myself. I don't like myself. They have low self-esteem. Because they don't understand who they are. They have in no Christ. idea who they are, who they were born to be, what the original plan was for them. Let alone who they are in Christ once they're in Christ. You know, and so it's, it's like uh, just a bunch of people like the blind f leading the blind. You know, I mean, we're groping around in the dark, trying to get illumination when in fact all we have to do is open our eyes. Now, God loves you, like I said, even more than you love yourself or even can think about loving yourself because you see all your flaws and you think he sees them too. And until now, you've probably only experienced conditional love. 
Conditional love, as Pastor Karen was saying, is based upon what you do. Perform well on the job, on the team, or in the relationship, and you're loved. Everybody loves you. In opening your life to Christ, you have found total love and acceptance, even at the most degrading level that you could possibly think of yourself as on. Uh, whatever is the most vile and ugly thing that you can imagine in your own mind's eye, that's you in, in front of Christ. And you come just as you are, and you're accepted like that. And mm -hmm. he makes the transformation in the twinkling of an eye. When you are born again, you are born through Christ, and you move into him, and you remain in him for all eternity. So you are no longer that vile, ugly, filthy thing. Now, that may be hard to comprehend, especially if you've never felt totally loved and accepted by anybody, but it's true. And unfortunately, you won't always feel that God loves you because it's not a feeling. Agape love, unconditional love, God's love is not a feeling. It's a reality. It is life itself. Then now there's going to be times when you find yourself doubting not only his love, but also his existence. I mean, <laughs> I know I've gone through that as I grow in Christ, you know. Sure, uh, sure. Before I found Christ, you know, I mean, or he found me. He, I should say because he always is hunting for us. He's the shepherd looking for the sheep. And we're the ones mm -hmm. wandering off into the wilderness. Somewhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you'll feel like giving up. And this is where we see even born-again believers sa saying, I want to commit suicide. I'm giving up. I can't find the, the what direction I should go in. Where is God? He's, he loves everybody but me. He talks to everybody but me. Why won't he talk to me? Why doesn't he give me a message? Why, 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 why? They've, they've doubted to the point that they feel like giving up. Well, don't. Do not give up. Because when God gave you a new life, it didn't come trimmed in lace and smelling like perfume, folks. Jesus began his earthly life in a smelly, damp stable, remember? And he tasted real life right from the very beginning. And that will be the flavor of your journey with Christ. No magic, yeah. just the promise of his presence with you. But that presence is more than you could ever ask for or think. Now, Pastor Karen, you have something you want to add? Well, I was just going to say, whenever we have... We're going to... As a born-again Christian, we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to have storms. We're going to start... We know we're going to have tribulation, uh, and we're going to feel, it's going to feel like God is absent in our life. Mm -hmm. But uh, T.D. Jake said something the other day which caught a hold of me. He said, don't the presence of the storm to indicate the absence of God. Yeah. So don't take the presence of the storm to indicate. Don't let your feelings get carried away and realize that God is, you know, he told us he'd go through the st midst of the storm with us. And uh, we would be able to come out on the other side. We just have to have faith. This is where our faith comes from and uh, where our faith comes in. And uh, we just have to believe, just have believe in Jesus that he's going to take us through that storm. Amen. And, and I love T.D. Jakes, and he's so spot on with everything. It's just, yes. he's wonderful. I love him. I um, do he has a way of saying things so simply, but the, with such wisdom. Yes, he does. And you know, he's exactly right that the presence of the storm doesn't eradicate Jesus from your life. He's there. Mm -hmm. You just turned your back on him and don't realize it. It's like the guys in the boat. When he was asleep at the back of the boat, he was with them. His presence was there. They mm -hmm. didn't have faith, and the storm arose, and they get all excited, and then, well, what's the matter with you? You don't, you don't care about us. You don't care if we die. You know. Well, of course he does. And if they had it, taken the time to realize that, of course they were they were with him physically, so they were in, a, and they were in more of a um, a fleshy experience with him than they were in a spiritual experience with him most of the time, because he was teaching them life lessons in the spirit through the flesh. <laughs> It was kind of backwards to what we're learning it because we don't have him here in the flesh, but we do have his presence and our, mm -hmm. and his presence is so much bigger and so much greater and so much more comforting and wonderful than if we had had him here in the flesh because he was a man. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, th when we think about it, we think, oh, gee, if I could have just have Jesus here with me in the flesh, walking with me, talking with me. Yeah, that'd be great. But when you need your miracle and he's still a man, where's your faith? You know what right. I mean? You're going to look to him and he's going to go, well, uh, hey, you have the ability. You have the blessing. I am. God empowered you with it and I returned it to you. So, you know, hey, there you go. It's all on yeah, you. Yeah, it's like he's saying, <laughs> here, I'm the blessing. I'm with mm -hmm. you. And what did he say to calm the storm? All he said was peace. That's and right. the disciples were like, you know, help us. 
mm-hmm. we're drowning help us we're drowning and all on and he said you know i'm here mm-hmm. peace peace be still and sometimes that's all that we need to know is that he loves us he's with us mm-hmm. and we're going to come we'll we'll come through it we'll That's come true. through it uh, uh t- telling a little boat story on myself and my husband we had a, a boat at one point a yacht and we were going through the carquina straits and we went through at the wrong time of the day because mm. during a certain period of time you could go through and it was smooth and you didn't have any trouble but the carquina straits was where the ocean came and met the the uh, salt the salt water met the uh, uh, unsalt water, <laughs> whatever we call it, fresh water. <laughs> fresh water <laughs> and, yeah. and the the uh, rivers came down and joined it. And then during these Carquina Straits, uh, all the tide flow and everything, it was one massive mess. It was like a like a huge sea storm all the time. But certain times of the day, it was calm, and you could go through without you know, the turmoil and the tumult. Well, we didn't know that, mm. so we went through the wrong time of the day, and our boat bounced up in the air thank god for my husband being the mariner that he is anyway he uh he, it hit so hard we would go way up in the way in the waves and then crash down in the uh the uh, cavity that was left there in the, the trough of the wave and crashed down so hard that the seat under him where he was sitting in the pilot seat broke uh, mm-hmm. and and um i actually went down below and sat uh in the very bow of the boat at the bottom to try to put weight down there <laughs> <laughs> and I prayed the entire time in, in the spirit. I was mm-hmm. scared because mm-hmm. it, we couldn't see because the salt water spray was caking on the windows and I had to take binoculars and look and we had a, a what they call a cutty cabinet. It's a ice and glass uh, canvas and ice and glass so that mm-hmm. you roll it up. I had to roll the window up and look out around the side of the boat to be able to see where we were going. So I was helping him navigate. We couldn't see. Wow. And of course, when Carquina Straits has shallows and big craggy rocks and all kinds of stuff in there, so I mean, you're really in in trouble. And um, if you, you go can through get the, in trouble quickly, huh? And uh, he said he stood there and drove the boat and prayed. And I know I was praying. I was praying in the spirit. He was praying in the spirit. And the Lord gave us him. He for, didn't give me at first, but my husband had perfect peace. He what he was calm, collected. He just did his thing the way that he knew how to do it, as if Jesus himself was driving the boat, and I know he was. Mm-hmm. I was down once I got downstairs in in the bottom of the boat and sat there, and I just began to pray the presence of the Lord and enc- and enc- cased me and and enc- encompassed me, and I too got that perfect peace, even though we were bouncing and hitting real hard, and the boat would shudder, and you know, and it was like in any moment if we had been left to our own devices and we hadn't have been praying in the spirit we would have been scared like those guys in that boat we were going to capsize well what what happens your head goes into that thought process and and you're now making it worse because you've agreed with the enemy mm. you've agreed with the enemy that he's going to kill you and this boat breaking apart in the middle of the ocean and nobody's going to know you're there you know what i mean and so what happens you're going to manifest what you think what you believe so yes the Lord put it on our hearts to pray in the spirit individually we didn't discuss it we didn't have time and as we did the peace of God and the presence of God encompassed each of us individually and there was calm in that boat and we got through the Carquina Straits and into the area without we couldn't see remind you I mean the the salt water was caked on the 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 boat windshield Mm -hmm. and it was almost just like the Holy Spirit or an angel just guided us where we needed to go. And we Amen. got in, Hallelujah. into uh, God. the dock we were going to, tied up, and they said we went into the thing and we wanted to get out and kiss the ground, but we didn't, you know. <laughs> we went into the lodge that's there, the, the marina, and uh, uh, into the restaurant and bar area, and they said, uh, where'd you guys come from? You know, we said, <laughs> oh, we just came from uh, Sacramento all the way across the Carquina Straits. And they said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and you lived through it. <laughs> <laughs> our boat wasn't damaged or anything so I can identify with these guys and their fear you know it was a sure. really scary thing sure. but by the same token so it's not something like you just go well poo poo on you because you know you babies <laughs> but it's the idea that we didn't have the physical Jesus there to look at so we could turn around and say do something you know <laughs> because yeah. that would not have given them any peace if they in at now knowing what I know they really wouldn't have had that peace except that they 
uh, you have to remember that they were not doing anything at this time. They were in Jesus' grace while he was teaching them. They were just observers. And so he had to do everything, even though by that time they had done some things and had been practicing, and he thought they should be able to do it themselves. And he's right. But they weren't ready, and they they did like everybody else. This shows to, goes to show you they're just like we are. You know, they stepped out, exercised their faith, and failed, and so they ran over and said, Help! <laughs> Why aren't yeah. you doing something, Lord? I know so many born-again Christians that do that. They pray and they say to me, Well, Pastor Stephanie, why isn't God doing something? He should be doing something. Well, he already did. He sent his son to the to the cross, and he died for you so that you didn't have to even be scared. You just don't realize it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that was a rabbit trail. So, anyway. No, no, that, is, that was the perfect example of what we were talking about. God says I, I You know that... That God, in fact, when we're in trouble, he performs at his best. Yes, he does. When, when we're in trouble. And... You know, recently, uh, and this has no bearing on what we're talking about as far as water and boats and stuff, and that, but love it does. And it also has to do with faith. Recently, I had a health issue um, that was only lasted about 24 hours. But at the time that it was very severe and I prayed and prayed. I took dominion, authority. I did everything that I know how to do. And finally, the following morning when I was, still had no success, mm -hmm. um, I said, Lord, you know that in my weakness, you're my strength. And yes, I, I, need, yeah. I need you now to be that strength. And yes. he was, and the issue does, just absolutely righted itself immediately. I Absolutely. mean immediately. Yeah. So and praise the Lord for that because it was a nothing important that I belabor and give you all the details. But it's, it was just a an issue that we all get them every once in a while, a health issue that is something that's really heavy on us, you know. And and uh, it's a symptom. We know mm -hmm. that those are symptoms. But the thing of it is, is they can become so oppressive that our focus is now off of God and over here onto the cares of this world. In other words, we're over here facing the situation and we're looking at that that thing like it's Mount Vesuvius <laughs> and, and we have to tell that mountain to move. And this is the first time, in, and I have to say that this, and maybe I shouldn't be telling on myself, but this is the first time that I have actually used that expression. And I do believe that it was because I was tired and I was tired of the fight and that the Lord, I just what got like liver, you know, how liver looks just bleh. And mm -hmm. and the the Holy Spirit laid that scripture uh, reference into my not not Mountain the scripture itself. Mm -hmm. The uh, the in your in he in our weakness he's our strength. You know, laid that on my heart and I spoke it out. I just felt like I have to speak that, so I did and I spoke it out to say it to the Lord because I believe you should speak speak things and I don't tell you what I believe, but I do think that you should speak out loud when the enemy is attacking you. You speak out loud the word of God. You don't let that enemy. Think because if you're silent, you lose the thought and it trails off, you know. Yes. But if you mm -hmm. speak it out, you finish it because you're speaking. So you have to finish what your sentence is. Uh, it's kind of like a discipline. But um, to show you the difference in in the faith level, it brought me to a whole different perspective of faith that I hadn't experienced heretofore, you know. And mm -hmm. once again, it worked, you know. I mean, because our faith does work, and without faith, you can't please God. So all my my expounding all my exhorting everything that I had always done that usually works it wasn't working and the Lord was saying come on come on they were rooting for me <laughs> you know get there's you know change the picture and how do you do that well acknowledge the fact that it's not about you you don't have any control so you've done all you know how to do and what do you do when you do that you stand and so what do I do? Stand on my faith? No, I stand on the faith of God because I don't have the faith anymore. I've run my limit. Now I assume his. In my weakness, you are my strength. Amen. And so I'm relinquishing strength to him, and he reached down and just plucked me right out of the mire. You know, praise the Lord. Amen. So, Well, you know, the Lord told the Israeli people when they were going through the Red Sea, he said, mm -hmm. stand, mm -hmm. stand and see the salvation of the Lord mm -hmm. for you. I will deliver you, and you shall hold your peace. That's right, and there you have it. And it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, and if we are aware of what's going on around us, where God is concerned, if we're aware of his presence continually, make ourselves yep. aware of it, and kind of divorce ourselves from the natural, and 
try to live as much as we can in the supernatural by if by that I mean in the presence of God just being aware of him and be keeping him in your forefront of your life and your mind and your heart um, then you're gonna see those scriptures come to life in your life mm -hmm. and you're gonna see miracles those are many miracles those are miracles that we blow off of the next five minutes afterwards and say oh thanks Lord and then you go off and about your business and the next thing you know you're in the next uh, kettle of fish you know what I mean Mm -hmm. Those are things that we need to stop and, and build our Jehovah Jireh altar. This is a Jehovah Jireh. This is a memorial. This is something to me because it was a new wrinkle. It was something new that I spoke out of my heart that was in there. It was in there, but I didn't know it. And it came out of my heart for the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. And when it did, it was what the doctor ordered. That was the medicine. It just ignited that faith. It was the, the connector between God's faith and my faith. You know? I see. Mm -hmm. And it put, pulled me up and over into victory. So, God says... Otherwise, I, you would have been distracted. Well, uh, yeah. I was giving up. See? I'm, we were talking about giving up. I said, don't give up. That's another way of giving up. Well, I give up because, obviously, I can't do this. So, oh well. You know? And I'm one of the world's worst for trying to lay everybody's uh, thing on them. In other words, once you are born again, you now have the power, and I teach that, you know, you have the power, you have the ability, get in there and do it, get in there and do it, get in there and do it, but it's not the doing of it, it's the being, and I should clarify that, because once you're born again, you have become a new creation, and it's the being now of that new creation that sustains you and touches the Holy Spirit and touches the supernatural, and, and where you now connect with God and with Jesus Christ continually, and the Holy Spirit. So it's not the doing. And I have been remiss because uh, in my verbiage, I have led people to believe, I do I do think, I've led people to believe that they have to, it's all on you, get in there and do it now. You know, and it, that's not it. It's not on you, it's on Christ. You know, and it's the Christ in you that's responding to it. <laughs> so I just mm -hmm. wanted to, I guess I was clarify supposed to clarify that, that and know. I didn't know it and that's why I brought it up. But um, mm -hmm. Anyway, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. You know, there's a Danish proverb that goes like this. The next mile is the only one a person really has to make. Think about that. The next mile that you're walking is the only one that you really have to make. Where you're going, one step at a time, one foot in front of you. One goal in front of you at a time. Mm -hmm. Moment by moment. And my message lately uh, has been... Uh, in the uh, master class, we've been going through uh, the book of Revelation explained. And we are in uh, Revelation chapter 10 right now. And in chapter 10, that's what it's all about. It's one step at a time. It's not the doing, it's the being. It's, it's the, you become, you're becoming this Christ-like person. You're becoming more and more like Christ, more and more like God. In other words, you're developing in, in, um, in your spirit man, you are developing that image, that likeness of God to the extent that you really aren't seen anymore. God is seen through you, you know, and mm -hmm. and it's not that. It's a being. It is not a, a, a doing. It's a being to be. Right. You know? Well, I think, you know, after Jesus' death, after, after his crucifixion, he gained, Jesus gained, gains the right to our heart. That's right. Yeah, we're part of him, mm -hmm. but... How does how is that? I think the key here is the Holy Spirit, because He is the Holy Spirit is the one that imparts the love of God, the peace of God, the God's character, God's innate character into our. It comes from the heart of God into our hearts, mm -hmm. and and that that link is the the key here is the Holy Spirit. Uh you're not gonna. Well, uh, no, I'm. I'm. I didn't. I missed something. Somehow I didn't connect with something that you were saying because it's. I like. I'm waiting for you to finish the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I. So I missed it. I'm sorry. I missed it. Well, so can you Christ go dwells into it in our hearts. Yeah. Through the faith, and we grow into this fullness of God mm -hmm. through the power, the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Which is the Spirit of Christ. Which is the spirit of Christ, mm -hmm. right? The Holy Spirit is Christ's spirit. Yeah. But it isn't. He's the enabling power that uh, builds this fullness. It like uh, Romans five five tells us that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
that's uh, Romans five. Five. I, yeah. Okay. I guess what I'm what I'm missing is this. I was I'm on a different page in my head. I was talking about being. You know, the Christ in us makes us a new creation, and then we become, and we and now our life is not a lifestyle per se, like fleshy lifestyle. It is a being. We become. We be this new creation. Uh, and, and I'm trying to hook, we, we're hook not that up the, to you, we're not what carnal. you're talking about. We're not carnal anymore. No, we're not. I mean, you made that transfer from carnal into the spirit. Right. Oh, and, and that's where you're hooking the spirit up. Okay. Yeah. I, see, that's where I was missing the connection. It was like psh, going right by you. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, was, I wasn't real clear. Mm -hmm. No, no, it was okay. Clear. I just missed it. I, I was, I just could not wrap my head around that for some reason. I said, what am I missing? And I just needed you to explain a little clearer. And now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. And you're right. Then the key is the Holy Spirit. And thank God we have him. You know, we, uh, I really believe that that is a, an important factor in our lives. That's the most important. Now, um, the knowledge that God loves us is going to keep you going when the next mile seems intolerably long. I don't know about you, but I've walked 15 miles in in one foot <laughs> from time to time. You know, when you're stuck in a spot and it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? Um, yeah. When that's that mile that you have to walk. And uh, it says in the word of God, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see what a bundle that is? That's Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Yeah, I think that verse above all other verses that Paul gave us really expresses agape, uh, agape love. That's right. And if you can get a hold of that and just absolutely let it permeate your spirit. Just nothing, meditate on that. Yeah, just meditate on absolutely that. Absolutely nothing is supernatural, nor nothing in the present, nor in the future, or anything, nothing that's going on in the flesh, nothing in anything in creation at all will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. And Jesus is the love that God sent to save us. Yeah, and, and he expresses it so well, and David expressed it very well in Psalms 139, verse 8. Um, because he says, if I go to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you mm. are there. Oh, yeah. If I take the wings of the dawn or dwell in the mm. remotest part of sin, of the sea, not sin, of the sea. And he says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? There's absolutely, we're absolutely tied into the Lord wherever we are. Amen. You know, it's just, it just, that just, it's comforting. You know what it's like? It's like God wrapping his arms around you and pulling you close to him and holding you. And you feel the warmth of his body against yours. And it's, it's like a mother that holds the baby and you know, you're comforted and you know that you're safe. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. And our faith rests in what God has revealed about himself to us. He specifically right. wants us to believe and rely on his love for us. And he talks about his love all the way through the Word of God. The Lord delights in those who fear or reverence him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. He loves us, and if we can just get a hold of how much God loves us, it'll change your life. It'll change the way you think, the way you see the Word of God, the way you perceive yourself with others. Psalm 147 verse 11 was that one. And the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Psalm 33, 18. You know, King David, uh, whom God referred to as a man after my own heart, trusted God's love. Now, here we go into the trust factor, which I, I live with. <laughs> I, I believe that this, this is, what do I believe? I believe, and I'm not saying what I believe. I'm just saying, what do you believe? Is what I always say to everybody. What do you believe? For, I believe that, that um, God loves me. And that nothing by any means will ever, ever rip me out of his, snatch me out of his hands. That the love of God and, the, and that that love, because God is love, so permeates me and the atmosphere around me that it carries me through any condition, any circumstance. I mean, and that's what it's designed to do. Why? Because I now have the love of God inside of me. Where mm -hmm. before I was in darkness and under the curse, I now have that love inside of me. It was, the God says, poured down, shed abroad, poured down and filled up to overflowing in my heart and out of my mouth so that it will flow out and touch others. And Amen. that's w the way we're all supposed to live. Think about the harmony that we would live in if we lived like that. But we don't. You know, 
man it is right. and i'm not gonna say and make excuses for everybody including myself well we're we're a work in progress and you know no we're not trying we're not trying hard enough we're not applying that we're just making excuses uh, uh trying to justify our not doing it <laughs> but if we tried it would manifest and i say that because that's god's heart his desire well, maybe yeah. that's how, why he told us to go out and um, consider our neighbor before ourselves and love our neighbor as ourselves. Absolutely. Because as we, lo as we uh, love our neighbors at our, as ourselves, we're filling up with this fullness of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Jesus even tells us that, that and I'm going to paraphrase here, but he tells us that um, when we uh, visit somebody in jail, we visited him. When we mm -hmm. took somebody a meal, we fed him. You know, he tells us, he explains it, how you love your neighbor. You mm -hmm. do good to those who despitefully use you. You know, you turn it, turn the other cheek. All of it's in there and it's called the love of God and it's unconditional. It's unconditional so that no matter what they're doing to you, you look beyond that and you see the individual, which is a creation of God. Right. And that compassion then of Christ that now resides in you rises up and reaches out to that person in love, agape love, to bring them into Christ so that they too will have that peace. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think even with our enemies, mm -hmm. um, those who we have difficulty with in this life, oh. um, th th as we give them love, we we learn to like them. Yeah, that's right. You know, maybe you we do. didn't like them before, but as we give this agape love out, we... All of a sudden, we like this person. You mm -hmm. know? I had a, a, a woman that I worked with that just despised me. I don't know why. She just didn't like me. And she wasn't my superior, but she had, was a co-worker in, in a different department. But and we were all in the same building, and her desk was like around the corner from mine. Mm -hmm. She absolutely despised me. And I, and I never did understand why she didn't like me, because I'm very likable. <laughs> You are. You know? <laughs> just kidding but um, yes, she uh, I went in and I made a request and it was for uh, a building that I wanted to use uh, for my church services and my healing school and I was willing to rent but of course I, I needed to rent it for a song practically and she said I'll take it into consideration but she wasn't I could tell that I had hit a brick wall you know she wasn't going to consider it so about three hours later, she comes out of her office and she says, okay, and she's made up these contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, and she says, here's the contracts for the dates that you wanted. And she said, I'll give it to you for this amount. And the amount was so minute that it was uh, mind boggling for me. It was like, what? Say it was this is God. <laughs> anyway, and she said, I have no idea why I'm doing this for you. And I looked at her and smiled. And I said, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. She and I were arch enemies. Uh, I, I didn't hate her, but I mean, she was my enemy. And I kept loving her anyway. I prayed for her. She, in, ve in turn, came and term did a whole complete turnaround because of the love of God. I had nothing to do with it. I did absolutely nothing except maintain. And <clears throat> God changed her heart. We became fast friends. She lives in, in uh, actually in Florida. And we keep in contact. Now, we don't keep in as close contact as we did before. But the, she, she and her husband wanted a child in the worst way, and they were unable to have children. So she asked me, came to me and said, uh, and she was a uh, practicing Jew, Jew lady, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a Jewess. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she came to me and she said, will you lay hands on me and pray for me and my husband to have a baby? And I did. And they got pregnant. And not that it wasn't yeah. me. It was about the, the, I'm not saying it was me. What I'm saying no. is, the turnaround in God that she left all these strict ritualistic things that she believed in, which is fine. I'm not poo-pooing her faith. But she reached out to God and beyond that and to Jesus Christ. And when she did, she was healed. They had they have several children now, you know. And uh, That's they, a wonderful story. They have That's a wonderful, wonderful home and life in, in Florida. And they uh, her husband is born again. And she is a completed Jew. You know, she believes in Jesus Christ and has a relationship with him, but also still keeps her faith the way she wanted. And that's okay. Nobody cares. Yes, you of know, course. Because that's mm -hmm. important. Um, but uh, when we became friends, I mean, you were saying you become friends. We became fast friends. And um, I don't 
keep in close touch with them now. We send Christmas cards every year. That's about it. Uh, but when her children get old enough to graduate, which are going to be in a couple of years, <laughs> you know, if they were babies, then um, I'm sure I'll get announcements and whatnot. But anyway. Uh, but isn't it interesting when we were talking about forgiveness before yeah. also, isn't it interesting that God puts people, I think, in our path on purpose mm -hmm. that we can... Like our immediate family, the people that we work with, you you were saying you were working with this person, uh, that that's a challenge for us, mm -hmm. so that we will learn to, if follow him, learn to forgive, learn to learn his agape love, and how to extend that to someone that we may not care for. That's right. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's amazing, and and you always look at this in hindsight when it's happening to you, you're not aware of it, but you know it's like oh this happened and you're aware. Like I was totally aware of why she was doing it she didn't know but i did you know i mean that at the time but the actual uh forthcoming of it you know what i mean the the manifestation of it how it rolls out in other words we're not always aware of it mm -hmm. until afterwards we look back in hindsight and go look that's what look what god did or i had a friend who say look at god <laughs> you know and, Let's and how wonderful give the glory he is. to the lord give that's the right because he is the real reason now it, the, the Word of God says in Psalms 59, verses 16 and 17, I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. O oh, my strength, I sing praise to you. You, O oh God, are my fortress, my loving God. And uh, Jesus describes the depth of his love for us this way. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. For if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. John 15, verses 9 through 11. He loves so us. that's telling us that when we obey him, he lo he not that he doesn't love us when we don't obey him, because he'll still be there, but obedience equals love right obedience yes. to god equals love it, well that's the result of love obedience is the result of love result it, yeah. of love yeah because if you are, love someone it you know if you love like this is kind of a bad example because it's flesh but when you get married to somebody you love your husband you love your wife or whatever um you will do anything for them that they request and if they say i want you to take the garbage out on monday because it it, I know they don't pick it up till Tuesday, but I want it all out of the house. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a command. And the, your job is the garbage, <laughs> you know. Then because you love that person, you don't care about it. it. Garbage is garbage. You'll take it out, you know. But if you didn't feel like doing it, you'd do it anyway because you love the person. You know what I mean? It's the result of love in that regard. But it's also... Love is the wellspring. It's like a fountain. It's like an artesian well inside of us. When we accept Christ as our love, our Lord and Savior, that wellspring, uh, it's like it's flowing underneath the earth and, and wherever we're standing, boink, there it comes and now it's in us and it's coming up through us. And we can't open our mouth. We can't do a, a, a deed or whatever that it doesn't flow in love. That's what it's supposed to be. But we stop it by taking our focus off of God and what he wants and we move it over onto what the enemy wants to do for our destruction. Mm -hmm. By He's painting an ugly picture, and we're looking at that image and living it and accepting it. Because we're looking with our eyes in the natural, and we shouldn't be. We should never look with our eyes in the natural, other than to see where we're going. We should be looking through our spiritual eyes, which is our godly connection. And when we do, we will operate in love, because that's in us. Mm -hmm. We can't not operate in it. Think about it like this. It's filled you up and it's overflowing. But if you're not watching, then it's not coming out. you got to plug. You're going to explode eventually. <laughs> that love has to go somewhere and it doesn't evaporate, you know. We have to pour it out. It's like God had to pour his son out on us to save us, to redeem us, so that we could be in his presence. He had to. And his law and rule was that it had to be through blood. He did it himself. The very first sacrifice was him making the animal uh, skins for the, the Adam and Eve. For Adam and Eve, uh -huh. He shed animal blood, and that set up the precedent of the blood sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and that was for atonement. That had to do once a year, as we all know. Now, with Jesus' blood, it was for once and for all. 
Never again. Now everything has been elevated from the earth and moved back up out of this atmosphere into the supernatural where, we're, where we live. That's our, our being. That's where we have our, our um, citizenship is in mm -hmm. the heavenlies. We were created in there. Too many people have the impression that God created the earth and then he went down here and he stood on the ground and he picked up dirt and blew in it and rubbed it back and forth and created man. We are created from the material. You read the word. It doesn't say he did that. He said that we, he created man from the dust, from the material that the earth is made of. Mm -hmm. Where did he get it? From the heavenlies. We were created in the heavenlies. We have our, our citizenship in the heavens, not in the earth. We're placed in our kingdom. This is our kingdom to rule and reign in. This is our home away from home. We, we are sojourners here, the Bible says. So we're vacationers. We're here to do something, and we're in and out. Do your job like somebody who comes out of town to do a job, and then he leaves and comes back home. That's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, we're set down here, blinded by the enemy and the atmosphere, the demonic atmosphere that surrounds this planet that we have been sent down here to do our job on. And so we have to find our way to the light, which we do. Jesus Christ, who is the door, we're... We accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We are re-empowered now with God's empowerment, the blessing, and we are now able to do the job that we were uh, sent to do. So we do that. What is it? Love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Our job primarily here, there's other jobs here, and I, but that's too far into the future for to discuss. Anyway, but right now, what we should be looking at is the billions of people that are on this earth that we're supposed to be reaching out with what? The Word of God? The love of God, folks. The love. How do we do it? Well, through the spoken word and through our actions, through our lifestyle, through what we believe and, and the love of God that we experience. And we share our experiences. And I'm going to tell you something. I am no different than anybody else. God has no reason to want to bless me better than anybody else with these wonderful things that happened to me. But I do know this, when something does happen to me and I t run to the, my high tower, I run to the Lord, he's my refuge, I run to the Lord with it, he's right there. He's like, I'm like a little kid, I run and say, help, you know, pick me up, pick me up, something ugly is getting me, <laughs> you know. And, yeah. he, and he picks me up and hugs me and holds me close, and says, shh, 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 it's okay, it's okay, calm down, I'm here, I'll take care of it. And he does, and then he gives me a hug and a kiss, puts me down on the, the ground, and sends me off my on my way again. That's and, beautiful. And yeah. each time that he does, I remember the incident. I remember the experience. And I go forward saying, you know what? I can do this. But you have to become as a child. Now, I'm not saying you have to do what I do. But I'm saying, I, I get, I'm a very graphic person, and I get images, and I need God to paint pictures on the wall for me to spell it out so that I can get it. And that's what he gave me. So don't be afraid to let your imagination run with you. And I'll tell you why. Because that's how God talks to you. We connect with through our imagination to God. And he speaks. He makes a picture. Think about it. He spoke. He had an image in his head and his heart. He spoke it out. It manifested. Mm -hmm. But it, it had manifested before the foundation of the world. That means whatever he thought had already formulated. We, we were already created. We were already in his mind and his imagination. We were already in his throne room, having gone through the complete thing with Jesus on the cross, redeeming us. The whole plan. They're right there. And then we're set down here to do the will of God. And what happens? Jesus comes and kind of reenacts it for us so that we get the picture. We get it because otherwise we're still born here under the curse. Blinded. See? Yeah. So... Uh, if you look at it from that perspective, from the foundation of the world, from before the foundation of the world, we were in God before we were in Christ, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so consequently, we already have the victory over all the stuff that we're going through. It's not reincarnation, you know, it's not karma. It's God, and it's the love of God. And through all of it, he's sustained us and lifted us up and carried us through it. All we have to do is just go along with it and flow like the river, you know? Anyway, go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think, no, I've, that's beautiful what you're saying. I think that Psalms tells us a little bit, Psalms 139, mm -hmm. um, really, if we meditate on that and know that God knit us together in his mother's, in our mother's womb, that he, he brought us forth on the day that we were born, that 
it, it's his desire to lavish his love on us be, simply because we are his child. Uh, you know, that he's familiar with all our ways, that he knows everything about us, knows every hair on our head. Mm -hmm. We just meditate on that. I think we we understand or we get to know uh, how much God loves us and how mu that we're his creation and uh, that he wants to bless us in everything that we do. Amen. I agree with you 100%. You know, God loves us no matter what even when we disobey. Why? Because he's already set a law in place in the, the new laws that Jesus gave us in the blood covenant that we are, uh, once we're born again, we are forgiven all sin, past, present, and future. So when we disobey, we've been forgiven already. But we live in his love, you know, and we will live in his love, enjoy his love as we obey him. Because why? Because we enjoy knowing that we have done the right thing. We've pleased the Father. There's mm -hmm. that connection. It's like when you do something well and somebody pats you on the head and says, hey, that a girl or a boy, you know, this this is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> this person gets an A on their, their report card, you know. It makes you feel good, you know. Yeah, and he gives us the grace now so that we don't get too prideful in exactly. this love. He gives us the grace to repent now when we realize that we're not aligned up or we're not obeying him like we should be obeying That's him. Right. I'm going to give you all some homework because I want you to grow in your understanding of God's love. Take some time over the next few weeks. Read Psalms 103, John 15, and 1 John 4. And note all the ways that God's love is described. Just do it and then meditate that. And Psalm 139 as well. I'd like you to meditate that. You know, if you meditating means not picking a, a note and going, mm, you know, it's not like that. Meditation on the Word of God is reading it, digesting it, thinking about it, eating it, eating the Word. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We eat through, we consume the Word, and the Word consumes us. And then it takes over, and you get your understanding going, and, and the Lord will show you revelation that you didn't know was there but you have to ruminate it you have to chew it up and talk about it speak it out and then chew it up again you know talk about it to your husband to your wife to your kids to your friends over coffee talk about it to your with your prayer partner or, or your pastor your sister whoever your brother talk about it digest it pastor karen and i do this with this program right here we talk about it we both have a, a uh, fairly good, I think, mature Christian understanding of God's Word. Uh, <clears throat> and yet when we talk about it, we're sharing right here, live on the air, unrehearsed, and we talk about the different things, just like I missed her point the other a minute ago, and so we talked about that until we got it straight. That's what you do. That's digesting. That's meditating the Word. We're out here today meditating the Word of God with you. We give you some Word, then we talk about it. We meditate it, and that's what that is. And what comes out of that? Enlightenment. We get revelation. We go, oh, and we won't sit here and go, oh, I get it. But we'll come back later after the program and say, you know what? I got something really good out of that today. Mm -hmm. You know, and you'll find that when you do that, you will get more and more revelation. Because we're not supposed to stagnate. We're not supposed to get born again and do nothing and become a couch Christian. We're supposed to be doing it, folks. And it's don't give me the old static, I don't know what to do. There isn't anything you have to know how to do. You just share what God has given you. That's all. So it's easy. I think that's a wonderful exercise and one that I'm going to do all week and also meditate and maybe come back with some new revelation for those people who are yes, listening. Me too. Me too. I have a lot to, to consider. and the th Well, just like I was sharing with you about the attack I was under and how God gave me that little blurb. It wasn't something new. It's old. I mean, it's something I should have known, did know, didn't use. See, that's what I'm talking about. It's all there. It's at your disposal. And then let the Holy Spirit open your mind and let the Holy Spirit feed you. He'll tell you what to do, what to say. That's what Jesus did. He did what the Father said to do. He spoke what the Father said to speak. You know, he did exactly that. And God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Mm -hmm. And when he got to Gethsemane, and he said, wait a minute, I know what the end result is. I know that this is marvelous. I know that this is so glorious I can't stand it. I know that I've been chosen and born for this purpose. But I'm not afraid to die. 
I don't think I can handle it if you turn your face away from me, Lord. I have to do this as a man without your help. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so he, he said, but you know what? If you can let this cup pass, okay. But if you can't, I'm still going for it, you know. And he did, and look what happened. We're saved today because of what Jesus did then on the cross. The, and, and There's the depth of God's love right there. Right there. In that garden, in the garden, and on the cross. On the cross. I, I love that, uh, this is an old one, but it's the old one where they show Jesus on the cross and says, uh, Jesus loved me this much, and he stretches his arms out. You know, the person stretches their arms out like they're on the cross. Mm -hmm. That much goes on and on and on and on around the world. And I, I got a, a vision of that years ago. I, I was... The Lord showed me a ministry of some kind, and I'm not talking about mine, but just ministry in general. And he showed me God, Jesus on the cross, and Adam and Eve below him, anyway, and uh, and then people, you know, coming uh, kind of like a tear, uh, I don't know what to call it, like at the foot of the cross and like it's on a hill and it goes down the hill with these people. But all of them were hooked to a vine, and out of Jesus' outstretched arms were vines coming. Uh, and connecting to all these people and out of and what it did was it, it disappeared in them but it came out of their hands and then out of their hands and it till it encircled the entire globe it was like he was on top of the globe and here it comes and all the people surrounding it going around it and all that vine until it was completely lush and vine covered and um i can't draw i mean that's not one of my talents uh, being artistic in the uh, uh, being able to draw well so I asked, uh, you know, when you get a vision of something that's going to be really cool, you need somebody else to catch that vision with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I couldn't get anybody that could catch it. I kept, I describe it. My nephew tried and he, um, he got the vision, but he never had the time to do it because I wanted him to do it in, um, uh, in relief, you know, like on a, a, a big mural -y kind of thing where the globe sticks out from the wall and Jesus is in relief on it. So it's almost embossed. Um, Mm -hmm. I could see the finished project and, and the product, but I couldn't make it happen. <laughs> but I never forgot it. You need a connection yeah. with an artist. Friend. Amen. I will. My mother and my dad, either one, were very talented. My son no is way. a great artist, and my nephews both are really great and talented artists, but they just don't have the time for me. So in that regard, and maybe someday they will, and, and maybe it's not important, but the Lord gave it to me as a vision. Or maybe someday I'll just sit down and he'll miraculously make my hand do it. <laughs> There you go. I'll say, okay, I'm closing my eyes, do it. Da, I can da, da. do all things in Christ who <laughs> strengthens me. me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, well, it looks like we're running low on time, so we'll pick this up next time. If that's, do you agree with me? Sure. Okay. It's a good place. So right now we're going to, to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as Savior, but I want you to take some time right this minute to uh, just enjoy meditating on, like I was saying, uh, who you are and what Jesus has done for you as we uh, listen to this and soak in his presence.
family, we want to give you all a chance to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today. You know, he will instantly pardon your infinite debt today. In a moment's period of time, all you have to do is repeat this after me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of the living God. You were born, you came in the flesh to atone for my sins and all sickness and disease on the cross. You were raised from the dead after three days. Lord, I come to you today and I repent of my sins now and ask you to come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior now and forever. And Lord, if I have any unforgiveness towards someone, you're bringing into my mind that the picture of that person right now. And I... I declare to you today, Lord, that I will not hold that person captive with unforgiveness because of all the mercy that you have shown me. Their face, their face is appearing to me right now, and Father, from my heart, I forgive them from my heart. I thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, and your compassion for me, and I choose today to serve you all the days of my life. Family, if you've said that prayer, we welcome you into the family of God today. Hallelujah. And God bless you.
up the elements of the covenant that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body and his vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that we partake of the body of Christ and we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in his blood and renewed within as we perpetually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Pastor Karen? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the historical comparison, which we always do when we have this communion service. We know that the Hebrews sacrificed a lamb, and they put the blood on the doorpost of their house. In Exodus 12, 13, God said, When I see this blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you. So thus the Hebrew families were protected from both sickness and death as a result of the blood and body of the lamb. So we see that the appointed festival of Passover became the forerunner of the Lord's Supper, where the Lord Jesus himself becomes the sacrificial lamb, and his blood was shed on the cross for not only our sins, but for our complete healing, our complete salvation, our complete deliverance, our complete protection. And in fact, we understand that Jesus was having Passover with his disciples when he instituted the Last Supper with the New Covenant, where he said no longer would they emphasize deliverance from Egypt, but instead each time that they took the cup of wine and the bread, they would celebrate deliverance from sin and the promise of eternal life. You see, the blood of the Lamb in Egypt was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus, who was identified as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the historical application of Passover is that we see its prophetic fulfillment in Christ, who as God's final perfect Lamb died during Passover. Communion also denotes a sharing. Um, and it's not only talking about our redemption through Christ, but also our future inheritance with him in the kingdom of God. Matthew 26, verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now looking at the elements, the bread and the juice or the wine, the Jewish unleavened bread used during Passover was called the bread of affliction because of the Hebrew slavery in Egypt. However, with the new covenant in Jesus, it is called the bread of life. Jesus said, I tell you for certain that Moses was not the one who gave you bread from heaven, and the bread that God gives you is the one who came down from heaven to give life to the world. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, and if any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, because whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. You see, your forefathers ate manna and they died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So, family, we are not only proclaiming the Lord's death through this unleavened bread and juice, but we're also receiving an impartation of his life through communion service. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the representation of this bread and blood in communion service with you. We know that you have created life eternally, and every time we partake of your body and blood, we receive a new infilling of your life through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's a partnership with Christ. It's actually our sharing in the love of God. And partaking of this one bread creates partnership between the members as well as it merges them into one body, the church. Now the word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Do this, perform this action, continually take the bread, give thanks, break it and eat it, and then take the cup and drink it after you bless it, all in remembrance of Jesus. Now the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often, and yet we aren't given any specific instruction from Paul as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. 
It is implied, though, that it's to be done with frequency, so that partaking of the Lord's Supper actually continually recalls to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. So do it as often as you want to or need to, my friends, because as we are instructed, we will discern now the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you, so that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you for the remission of sins. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know... The Lord's Supper is a feast. It's a feast of living union of believers with the Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits, and we are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life, and for that we are eternally grateful. Pastor Karen, can you close us with a blessing? Yes. Uh, family, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We pray that you received this today, and if you did, then yay, and if you didn't, call us for further assistance. We're available for it. <laughs> we want you to understand these messages, and sometimes we get confused, and sometimes we talk too fast, or we may get it, you know, we don't take time to correct something we've said that kind of left you with a question mark. Call us. Contact us. We're happy to discuss it with you and help you understand the messages even more. Pastor Karen is going to give you her contact information right now. And we're just starting on God's love this week, so tune in next week also mm -hmm. so that we can further um, establish, or if you have any questions, we can further answer those questions for you. Um, my ministry is called Refuge of Hope Healing Room. Uh, we have a healing room here live in Bylas, North Carolina, and we also online, if you go to my website, the Master's Touch, Pastor Stephanie and our website, the masterstouch.org and scroll down to Refuge of Hope, um, go to Words of Wisdom and there meditate on something that I had written on what does God think about you. Mm. And all of the um, verses that we had said today will be there. And before we meet next week, you know, we'd like to hear what kind of revelations you may, you may have. Um, also, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can get me on Skype under my name, Karen Weitzman, or Refuge of Hope Healing Room. Uh, if your talent is that you like to pray for other people, please come to Facebook at Refuge of Hope Healing Room and in help intercede with me for other people's uh, needs. Um, and uh, that's that's about all. Okay. Pastor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you can reach me by phone. There you go. For those of you who want to speak to me, you can reach me by phone uh, at 305-467-7232. You know, I just need to say that uh, Pastor Karen is a wonderful crisis counselor. She's got a, a wonderful understanding of God's Word and of healing. And her messages are marvelous. And when you go on the website and you read the things that are in Refuge of Hope, just go into each one of those, open them up and look at them. She has got some of the most wonderful, uh, helpfully, I mean, really helpful to things. And I mean, the way she put, puts things to help you understand uh, God's love, God's uh, uh, reason for you being here. <laughs> you know, um, she's got such a, a deep understanding of, of God and his love and uh, sometimes she doesn't even realize it, you know, but uh, she writes beautifully and she'll reach out and it'll pluck your heartstrings and you'll get revelation knowledge. So please do go onto the website and read her material. It's great. And especially since she's talking about the same subject, which is good. You can reach me at Dr. Stephanie at the Masters Touch dot org. That's my website uh, web address, web mail address. Uh, Doc, Dr. Stephanie is done this way. D-R-S-T-E-F, like Frank, 
E N I at the Masters Touch.org. Or you can reach me at my regular email at Masters Touch HS at Cox.net. That's Masters Touch HS at Cox.net. Poet at Cox.net. That's P O E T at Cox.net. Or M T H S Prayer at Cox.net. That's the letter M, the letter T, the letter H, the letter S, the word prayer at Cox.net. Thank you. For joining us at Living the Word, brought to you every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern and 12 noon Central. Remember, Proverbs 4, verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. And my friends, that's exactly what we're doing here, seeking God and gaining God's wisdom from His Word. Living the Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. We leave you with this reminder. 1 John 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So right now, however Jesus is, perfect, prosperous, abundant, full of divine health and wholeness, that's exactly how you are too. So meditate on that scripture until you become it, my friends. God bless you. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Here we Bye. go. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>